just yep. uh, Okay, thanks again. So it's not um, often that the surgeon gets a last last mm. say, but I'm going to talk about uh, mitral valve repair. We've already heard um, a lot about the mitral valve. We've heard that it's, I guess, the gold standard at the moment, certainly for degenerative valve disease, is to have it repaired. Sorry. Yeah. There you go. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is um, uh, our journey through robotic assisted valve repair and then two minimally invasive valve repair and some of the controversies around that um, and how we got there. Well, I'm from St Vincent's. Um, for those of you who don't know, we, we, uh, we're just across the other side of the city. Um, we do you know, about 800 to 1,000 cardiothoracic cases a year across the campus. Uh, we're a big transplant unit by, by world standards. We did 100 transplants last year, which is big, and together with Prince Alfred, we, we have a large ECMO program and we, and we share an ECMO retrieval service. Um, I'm going to touch on some mechanical assists or some mechanical pumps at the end of the, end of the talk, um, and we've been involved in those for, since the 80s, and um, we're some uh, uh, principal investigators on some of the newer devices. Um, and from the valve point of view, we, we um, have the whole suite of surgical valve options, um, robotic repairs and minimally invasive repairs, um, and, and with the structural heart sort of led by David mm -hmm. Muller and David Roy, David um, uh, Barron, it's all David's everywhere, and Paul Roy. Um, they, they have a very strong um, TAVI program. And um, the surgeons are chiming in uh, uh, more and more. We, we have a, a big mitra clip program. Well, not that big, but it's, we've done about 75 of them. Um, I remember the days where we stood in lead for four hours trying to, to get one to, to clip. Um, we've got better at it now. We can now do two in an afternoon and, and you know, with a case in between. So, um, and in, by and large, we've talked about it, but it's, it, I think it's good technology and has its place. Um, we've got a research precinct which, uh, with a large animal facility that we do a lot of this um, preliminary work in um, and a public and a private campus where we do this, the work. So just in the, in, in the, from a robotic point of view, you, you saw uh, in Jason Kaplan's uh, presentation he talked about the Da Vinci robot which really sort of paved the way for minimally access or minimally invasive mitral valve work. Um, and in this time period that I'm going to present my results in, um, we did about 52, we did 52 robotic repairs and for various reasons we decided to move on to, to minimally invasive approach. But it certainly is a great, it is a great uh, piece of equipment and for those of you who don't know, you put ports into the patient. One of the ports has a camera, you control the other hands uh, by sitting in with your head in the, the back of the elephant, as they say, and you look into a 3D screen and you get very good images of what you're looking at and you've got incredibly good dexterity of the robot, of the hands um, at the end of the, uh, the, end of the instruments. It, it led us away from uh, median stenotomies and now we could make little cuts and put ports in. Um, and, but what developed around that was um, we, we perfect, we didn't perfect it, but we, we fine-tuned techniques to put people on bypass peripherally. Um, we echo it within the, in the theatre became more and more um, prevalent and important. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and we can do more and more port access stuff. The, the bottom right picture is when we were doing uh, bypass surgery using the, the, the robot, so we can do some limited sort of bypass operations uh, with just port access, but that's another story. Um, so the, the systems evolve quite a lot from a clunky first generation system to now a quite sophisticated system. You can have two consoles, you can have people training, can be in the other room. Um, we haven't quite got it to be on the, on the boat um, so that um, you can be at home. Um, and, and part of the problem with the Da Vinci system um, is, is although it offers a great um, platform to do this and you can see what you can do in, in the middle there, it, it, we felt it didn't offer much advantage over a minimally invasive approach. Um, it was more expensive, there's no doubt about it. Um, you had to put in extra ports, so there was a, technically another incision. It certainly would take longer, um, not so much the operation side of things, but all the logistics. Um, so you'd go from doing two uh, you know, three cases a day to, to you know, struggling to get two done. And the other problem were urologists, um, and they're, they're problems in a number of ways, but the main problem was is that um, 
they, they just started making a fortune out of taking prostates out. So the robot's been taken over by urologists um, and they do three, three to four prostatectomies a day, six days a week. Um, so getting access to the robot was difficult. And so that pushed us into minimally invasive um, sort of work. As you can see, the portholes are the same, the incision's the same. Um, so from a minimally invasive point of view, we've done uh, about four, just under 450 cases. 286 of those have been repairs and we do replacements and a whole range of things can be done minimally invasively through, through that small incision. Um, um, Michael touched on some really important things is, uh, is that um, no, Minimally, in mitral valve repair really should be done in, in centres of excellence. If you look at all the mitral valve repairs that get done in Australia, there's not enough for every surgeon to, to be good at them. Um, the average surgeon in the US and Australia would do two or three, uh, three to four mitral valve repairs a year. So, um, and, and you know, I'm sure at, at, at Michael Centre and certainly at, at St Vincent's we're doing th three to four a week. So, and that means your anaesthesia gets better, your, your perfusion gets better, your, your ICU gets better, but it's like anything, if you hit a tennis ball every day, you're gonna be better at it. Um, so it's important to, to go, go to a team which is doing a lot of them. So I'm just gonna present the first 200 cases that um, we've done at St Vincent's and some of the issues we've had and some of the controversies because it's still ongoing debate about whether this can be done minimally invasively. So um, the patient characteristics are fairly standard, standard group. They're a younger group, um, and, um, and I'll go on to explain why. So the whole range of disease, um, the majority of them were myxomatous or degenerative. Um, there were some functionals, uh, a fair few rheumatics in there, and the occasional endocarditic. Uh, this is our standard approach, so very similar, but on the other side to how we'd put the tendine in, um, a smallish incision. Um, peripheral bypass and, and a few other little techniques. So you can see, see there that, so this is the cardioplegia line going in, this is a vent port going in, and, and this is the CO2 going in, um, and we use these for drains later, um, and this is a small stab in the auxiliary, if you like, and that's the cross clamp. Um, and that's an important thing to, to bear in mind, that cross clamp, and I'll, I'll explain to you later. The incision has to be has to be of a certain size because you've got to get this retractor in to retract the atrium up so there's no point making it really small because you can't get that in. I guess that's one advantage with the robot is that you could do it totally endoscopically because you can put a fourth port in and the robot has a little expandable um, retractor on it which, um, which is nice. And I still do robotic repairs but just not as many. Um, one of the criticisms that you get from the, the surgeons that don't do minimally invasive, and thankfully there's none of them in the room here, is that, oh, you can't see and you need a bigger. Now, uh, this is just me with a head camera on, so it's not perfectly in my vision, but I've got a beautiful view of the mitral valve there. I can assess it, I can, I can reach in and touch it with my finger. Um, from a surgical point of view, to get that sort of view through the front is actually quite difficult. You've got to pull the heart up and away. So the view is, is, is pretty good, it's pretty easy to, put these sutures in with these um, just slightly lengthened um, instruments. They're, they're lengthened not because it's a long way away, but because you want to get your hands out of, the, out of your view. Um, and you can see me here putting the annular sutures around. Um, and, I'll, um, and now what I'm going to do here is once these sutures are in, I'll test the valve and work out what I want to do with it. And so as we load the ventricle, you'll, you'll all recognise the pathology. You can see the posterior leaflet there starting to bulge. I'll give it one more shot and you see that cord pop out there and it starts to leak. So it, it's relatively straightforward there to put a cord onto the pap muscle and tie that leaflet down um, and, uh, and, and, and that's it. So I don't have any problem with the view. Um, so it's the same mitral valve repair and that's important. We're not compromising anything with the mitral valve. Um, we, can, we can deal with the same sort of diseases. Um, we can do replacements. Um, you know, as Michael mentioned this morning, um, a heavy calcified annulus, I would lean, push away from it. If there's a bit of calcium there, I might deal with it, but certainly none of the cases that Michael presented this morning, that's, that's, that's high order sort of stuff to deal with that, and it's probably better done through the front. Um, you can do other atrial procedures, as I'll, I'll mention. So, 
Um, so from an operative point of view, we've done 48, in this series there were 48 replacements um, and there are 152 repairs and there was one conversion to replacement. So if I went in and I started to repair a valve, uh, so what I would, if I wanted to repair a valve, I would put the annular plastic stitches in, I'd do the repair, we'd come off pump, we'd see how it looked. Um, maybe I'm going to say 5% of the times we might go back in and tweak it and make it look better. But if I couldn't get it right and I had to replace it, that's a failure. So um, I had one of those in that, in that uh, 200 and I couldn't, I couldn't get the, the repair to work. But in terms of replacement, um, uh, they were people for rheumatic. Or as we were talking earlier, there, you know, if you've got a 79 or an 80 year old lady, you've got a complex anterior leaflet pathology, you don't want to spend a long time on the pump uh, trying to fix that. You can replace her valve or his valve in, in 30 minutes and get out with, with exactly the same long-term results. So it's important to be a little bit um, prescriptive about what, you, what your intentions are. And the cross clamp times of 74 um, uh, is, is not too bad. Um, I think you could, maybe you could do it quicker through a sternotomy, I'm not sure, but our times are coming down and not too bad bypass times. Um, so, and we, we can do the whole range of repairs, posterior, anterior, two leaflet repairs or annular, uh, annular plasty only. Um, I, edge to edge, um, I, don't, I don't know how many Michael's done. I've not done too many Alfieri stitch. I it's, it's sort of I have a funny feeling about it, but, um, but uh, and maybe it's the mitra clip that's hurting me. Um, so as I said, you can do other things at the time. You can do a, a left atrial reduction. So if you've got a big left atrium, you can ablate the pulmonary, and they're in atrial fibrillation, you can ablate the pulmonary veins, you can reduce the size of the left atrium, you can close off the uh, appendage. So most of the things you can do, and the decalcification and reconstruction of the annulus, they, they certainly won't be cases that were like were presented this morning. They'll be little discrete areas of calcium that I'd feel comfortable about taking out and maybe putting a patch across it, but certainly not those calcium, you know, horseshoes that go from trigone to trigone, that's, um, I'm going to now send them to Michael. So. Um, early outcomes, no in-hospital mortality. Um, there were two strokes, both of which um, they recovered from, um, a bit of left-sided weakness, but left, left hospital mobilising normally, and one facial droop, but fully recovered. Um, TIAs had a few, uh, the usual smattering of um, of atrial fibrillation, but thankfully no in, no permanent neurological uh, issues because that was that's one of the criticisms of this technique, and I'll I'll, I'll talk more on it. Um, this is probably my most disappointing slide. All this was all this push for minimally invasive stuff was a, an attempt to get them out of ICU, get them out of hospital, and get them home, but that never doesn't seem to translate. The ICU, the intensivists want to hang on to them for various reasons, particularly in the private. Um, uh, um, in the public, you're out, out the door, um, here's your hat, and um, the hospital stay, it hasn't really come down too much because um, particularly in the private, people don't want to go home. You say, right, you're ready to go home, they go, oh, I might just stay another day, doctor. Um, and so, so, and you know, they're paying, I guess. So. Um, intubation times, once again, that's a cultural thing in ICU and we, we, we bang our heads on the walls every morning saying extubate, extubate. Um, but it's getting better, there's no doubt about it. Bleeding's respectful um, and transfusion, as I'll show later, is, is comparative to international standards. So um, thankfully, most of the repairs worked. Um, so I guess we, we might tolerate mild at the end of the case uh, in certain circumstances. Uh, I wouldn't in a in a young person, we'd, we'd go back and tweak it, um, but uh, certainly wouldn't tolerate moderate, and thankfully most of them had none to trivial. Um, and this, as I said, this represents our learning curve. It's across both campuses. It includes training um, and registrars doing cases. We had two mortalities. Both were in the replacement group, um, and they do reflect a sicker group. Uh, one was a subarachnoid hemorrhage one month after replacement, um, and one we, we couldn't work out what the cause of death was 46 months after replacement, but um, like, like all surgeons, we will blame ourselves or someone for it. So overall survival was, was very good overall. Um, in, the, in the repair group, thankfully 100% uh, survival at one in five years, um, so we, which is encouraging. So, um, and this is freedom um, from MR uh, a follow up of 22 months or so. so um, two, uh, I'm going to call them failures. One, uh, my first failure was in a GP, of course, um, and I did a posterior leaflet repair and he came back um, 
uh, I can't remember exactly how long, with an anterior cord that had snapped. So whether I damaged something while I was doing it, but I was able to go back and repair it. And then uh, there was another one where uh, I think they got endocarditis, so I had to go back and deal with that. Um, in the replacement group, uh, there, there has been, um, it, obviously those valves don't leak, um, and there have been some patients that I've had to go back and um, uh, um, so as I said, the recurrent MR after 18 months after repair, a uh, bias prosthetic valve uh, deteriorated 41 months after the repair, after the replacement in a young patient, and then an infected mechanical valve 45 months. Um, all of those I went back, once again in my early series, I went back via stenotomy. Um, it, was a, it was enough to have to do it twice, um, then to try and do it minimally invasive, which I don't think is a good idea for redos in certain settings. So uh, freedom from operation um, post repair is, is good at one year, and then, um, as, as I said, there's been one, um, uh, there's been two um, out to five years that I've had to go back on. Um, and post replacement we've discussed. So what are the controversies? The controversies is a, a stroke, neurological events, and, and it's around the fact that you're putting people on bypass peripherally, and so you're sort of perfusing their aorta and their head backwards um, from, from, from the groin uh, or the femoral vessels. So there were, there were large meta-analyses that came out, um, and the biggest one was a meta-analysis of 35 studies um, and showed a higher 30-day stroke. 2.1% um, versus 1.2%. So, um, but since then, the, it seems that um, uh, the, the stroke rate has come down. You can see our stroke data is up here in the corner. So, it's comparable to um, stenotomy, conventional stenotomy. So, we, we haven't seen the, um, a too higher inc increase in stroke rate, touch wood. Um, and, and the later studies are showing um, actually reduced risk in the minimally invasive group. And if you look at the sub analysis of of those studies, and I remember I showed you that picture of the cross clamp that went in transthoracically. So some, some centres use, use what's called an endo balloon to, to cross clamp the aorta, so they pass a balloon up the femoral artery, around the arch, and then below that balloon up in the aorta, um, and that occludes the aorta, they can then deliver plegia through the middle of it. That's called an endo balloon, and there's a higher stroke rate in those. And it's not surprising they're passing things through the arch and they're blowing things up in the aorta. But, aorta. but if you simply clamp the aorta, the stroke rate doesn't seem to, it seems to be very acceptable. And not that any of it is acceptable. But um, so, in terms of the important intraoperative times and the important um, things that we look at. Um, uh, our, our bypass time is comparable to stenotomy, and this is, this is international data, so big, big studies on the, on the left-hand side, minimally invasive, um, conventional stenotomy in our data. Our, bar, uh, our clamp times are acceptable, um, blood drainage is acceptable, transfusion is acceptable, ICU stay, it's interesting that um, minimally invasively, uh, e even the international experience is that they can't get them out of ICU, and similarly hospital but all, all slightly better than, than, um, than conventional surgery. And I think, I think it is better having a small incision here than a stenotomy if, if you're not losing anything by doing this procedure. And I don't feel the need to do this in everyone. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to have, for, you know, if someone wants a stenotomy, they can have a stenotomy. And similarly, I'm happy for surgeons who are not comfortable to do it this way to do it that way. The, the most important thing is to get the mitral valve repaired. That's it, end of story. It doesn't matter how you do it. Um, because everyone gets over a stenotomy. Um, and, and that's, the, as, as Michael mentioned, that's the key take home message is that you, you want um, to go to a centre where they're comfortable repairing a mitral valve. Not doing minimally invasive surgery, but they're comfortable repairing a mitral valve. Um, so it can be done safe, it can be done through a right thoracotomy. Um, there is low perioperative morbidity and mortality, and there's a high repair rate, and it's a durable, durable uh, result. So thank you.